Well, friends, uh, last week, as I shared with you, we saw that authentic Christians want to become like Jesus. And my point today is the more we become like Jesus, the more servant-hearted we will actually become. Christians are meant to be servants. I was preparing the sermon this week, and I'm thinking, what is the best illustration I can use to sort of talk about Christians being servants and what what does it really look like to be a servant and there's all sorts of great illustrations I can use I can talk about Martin Luther King Jr. and I can talk about Mother Teresa and I can use all sorts of great examples but perhaps the greatest example of what it looks like for a Christian to be a servant is when Jesus washed his disciples feet so brother we're gonna kind of have a go at just emulating what Jesus did On the night before Jesus was betrayed by Judas Iscariot, um, he actually washed his 12 disciples' feet. So he goes into the upper room in Jerusalem, and they're preparing to have the Passover meal together. But as he's preparing them, as they're getting ready, Jesus wants to wash the disciples' feet. Now, you can all see this going on. You can see what's happening. Um, Washing the Jews' feet before they ate was a regular custom in ancient Israel. Uh, One of the things is people didn't get around enclosed in sneakers like this. Most people wore sandals. And so as they're walking along, their feet are getting dusty. And the animals are walking along the same dusty streets, defecating. There's no sewer system, so you can imagine what's getting thrown out into the streets. And feet would become absolutely filthy, disgusting, dirty. Jeff's look pretty good, really. You prepped them last night, didn't you? You prepped them last night. <laughs> but feet would get dirty. And one of the things about ancient Near Eastern custom was you would often eat your dinner on the floor. So you'd actually sit on the cushions on the floor of the tent or the floor of your house, and the food would be spread out on a tablecloth in front of you, but often on a very little low table or actually on the floor. So when you're sitting there, your feet are really in close proximity to your food. You don't want them to be dirty, do you? And so Jesus actually got the disciples' feet and he washed them one by one. Now, you'll recall from the Old Testament that this was happened a fair bit. You remember when God came and visited Abraham and Sarah in Genesis 18? It actually says they washed God's feet. Isn't that an amazing thought? And then when Joseph's brothers came and visited him in Egypt, put this one in too, brother, if you can. When when Joseph's brothers came and visited him in Egypt, Joseph actually asked his chief steward to wash his brother's feet um, before they ate together. And when King David was on the run from King Saul and King Saul was trying to kill him, a wonderful Jewish lady named Abigail washed King David's feet and then she fed him. But the thing throughout the whole Old Testament is that it was always the junior person who washed the senior person's feet. It was always the inferior person who washed the feet of the superior person. And so in Jewish thinking, you always got the lowest slave or servant in your house to perform this duty. Just think for a moment. On the night Jesus was betrayed, the Son of God, God in the flesh, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one above everyone, assumed this position of washing his disciples' feet. And Jeff, how are you feeling as we're doing this? I'm listening. You're listening. How are you feeling about it happening? Uh, Yeah, probably uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. That's interesting. I'm feeling a bit uncomfortable too. I thought about bringing a gurney, but I thought it probably wouldn't have quite the same effect if I used a high-pressure washer. But Peter felt exactly the same. When Jesus said to Peter, I'm going to wash your feet, Peter was like, no, you're not going to wash my feet. This is below you, Lord. You're too significant. You're king of kings. I watched you ride into Jerusalem as the Messiah. You can't do something like this. It's beneath you. And Jesus said, unless I wash your feet, you have no part in me. And so he washed their feet. Just pull them out for a sec. Pull your feet out. 
both pull them out. Can you lift them out? Uh. He washed their feet. He dried their feet one by one. And when he'd finished doing this, and I want you to remember what you've just watched, washed today. It's watched today, not washed today. I want you to remember this. This is actually the picture of what servant-hearted Christianity looks like. This is what Jesus did for his disciples and he called us to follow him. Let me just put you up on the screen. This is what Jesus said straight after washing their feet. He says, do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord and rightly so. I am the king of kings for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. In other words, none of us are greater than Jesus. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. My first point today, I think scholars look at this passage and they go, oh, are Christians meant to wash one another's feet literally like another sacrament? That's a bigger debate. What they all agree on is this. Jesus' example has shown us that real Christians are meant to be servants, servant-hearted, and nothing is meant to be beneath us. Nothing is that lowly or pathetic that we should turn up our nose at it and say, I'm too good for that. Jesus was willing to wash feet. We're meant to be willing to wash feet. And so my first point today is Christians are meant to serve sacrificially to fulfill God's will. Jeff, put your hands together for Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Uh, I just want to notice the first 10 words in this verse. Therefore, I urge you, I'm encouraging you strongly, in view of God's mercy to you, to do something. He's about to get to application. For 12 whole chapters in Romans, Paul has been explaining how Jews and Gentiles are saved. How does a person get to heaven? Is it by being good and earning a place in heaven? And Paul said, no. Or, no one's good enough to earn a place in heaven. Everyone is a sinner. Jews are sinners. Gentiles are sinners. We're all sinners. We deserve to be punished by God. But God in his mercy sent Jesus to earth to take the punishment for our sin. That way God would be just in punishing sin, but could show us mercy and not give us what we deserve. Isn't that an amazing thought? Jesus took the punishment for all our wrongdoing so that we can actually become children of God and go to heaven when we die. Now, is that something you earn? No, it's something you receive as a gift when you believe in Jesus. When you simply believe Jesus died for you and you accept him as your Savior and Lord, you become a Christian, and in that moment, that moment of believing, your name is actually written into heaven. This is the gospel message. And Paul says now, he says, in view of God's mercy, because God has done this for you, because God has given you heaven as a gift, in view of God's mercy, I want you, God wants you, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. You're not doing it to get to heaven. You're doing it because God has given you heaven. You're saying thank you. That word worship is actually a Greek word for service, okay? Sometimes the word is translated worship. Sometimes it's translated service. Uh, there's something in this. The way we worship God is by serving God. You got that? 
the way we worship God is by serving God. And there's actually a parallel verse to this one in the very beginning of Romans. I'm going to show you it on the screen. This is kind of a turning point, but this is what Paul said right back in chapter 1. I just want you to have a look because the same word gets used again. In Romans chapter 1, 25, it says, they, talking about people in general, exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served. Do you see that word served? It's the same word as worship in Romans 12 that we just looked at. Worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Here's the problem. Here's the problem of sin that Jesus is trying to fix. When we reject God and we stop worshipping God and we stop serving God, we actually keep worshipping and we keep serving something, just not the true God. We've been made to worship, we've been made to serve, and so we worship something even when we reject the true God. And the thing he said at the beginning is we end up worshipping created things rather than the Creator. Now, people today still do this. Some people sacrificially give their bodies to their career. Some people sacrificially give of themselves, sacrificing their family to get a bigger house, or more stuff, or greater holidays. You see, we all serve and worship something that we think will satisfy us, and we sacrificially give our bodies to it. But this passage is saying, in view of God's mercy, he's saved. Do you now know the truth about God, or are you still believing lies about God? Is God merciful? Is he your father in heaven? Yes. If you know the truth, stop worshipping the things of the world. Stop serving the things of the world and come back to worshipping and serving the God who saved you and the God who loves you, the God who made you. Um, in view of God's mercy, this is what God wants you to do. Now, part of doing what God wants you to do is you need to renew your mind, which verse 2 talks about. Um, the problem is we've bought lies. We don't know what God wants to do. We actually come up with forms of idolatry where we make excuses. I think God wants me to do this, and it's got nothing to do with what God wants us to do. It's what I want to do. So we've actually got to renew our mind. We've got to study God's word. We've got to understand what God wants us to do with our money, with our children with our lives and then as he explains it to us we're not just meant to know what we're meant to do we're meant to do what god calls us to do um, one of the problems is when we begin to serve god it hurts have you ever noticed that when you begin to serve God, there is a sacrificial component because in choosing to serve God, you're choosing to give something else up that you want to do. God says, I want you to come and do this. And you go, I don't really want to do that. I want to do this. But you choose to do what God wants. You're actually giving something up. And there's always a sacrificial component. And when you're having to get up early to come and practice music at church, or you've got a bad back and you're trying to unload trucks on Friday night food, there's a sacrificial component. And when it starts to hurt, we're all tempted to give up and go, oh, it's too hard, I just want to stop. Friends, I want to say to you, service does hurt sometimes. Now, Jesus understands this. Remember what he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane? Father, I'm not having fun anymore. This is hard. It's really, really going to hurt. Please take this cup from me. I don't want to do it. But how did he finish? Yet not my will, but your will be done. And I want to say to you that Christian service always has a sacrificial component. And the problem is we're living sacrifices, remember? Offer your bodies as living sacrifices. And the problem with a living sacrifice is it tends to climb off the altar. You follow me? A dead sacrifice stays where it's put. A living sacrifice tends to run away because it doesn't really want to die to self. It wants to keep living for self. And yet you're called to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. So you've got to keep putting yourself back on the altar even when it hurts, even when it's hard. Now, to do this, we kind of have to do an Isaiah from 
uh, the Old Testament. I'm going to kind of refer to Isaiah chapter 6. You all know the prophet from the Old Testament. And I'm going to kind of paraphrase. This is how you offer your bodies to God as a living sacrifice. You say to Lord, here I am, Lord. In view of everything you are and everything you've done for me, here I am, Lord. I'm not much, to be honest. I'm a bit of a sinner. And I'm a man of impure lips. I tend to whinge and complain. And to be honest, I don't really want to do what you want me to do. I'd rather do what I want to do. But Lord, in view of everything you've done for me, here I am. I'm your servant. Send me. Have you done that? Do you all know the movie, the Australian movie, really popular 20 years ago, Babe? Do you remember the movie Babe with the little pig that wants to be a sheepdog? <laughs> okay. And there's this wonderful scene in the movie. Okay. The farmer, Mr. Hoggett, has been teaching the pig all these little things. And the pig looks up at the farmer, Mr. Hoggett, at one point. What do you want me to do? What else do you want me to do? What else? And the farmer looks down and says, that'll do, little pig. That'll do. He, he's taken the right stance with his owner. He's looking up going, I'm ready. I'm, what do you want me to do next? What do you want? That'll do, little pig. That'll do. You see, that is the right response to God for what he has done for us, looking up to him and saying, what is it you want me to do? Here I am. And when we do that, God's like, that's perfect. That's exactly what I want you to do. That's the right approach to have before me. That'll do, little child. That'll do. Have we really done that? Have you truly offered yourself to God as a living sacrifice, saying, here I am, Lord, what do you want me to do? Sadly, many churches, just hear me out. What a true Christian says is, here I am, Lord, what do you want me to do? Many churches, many consumer Christians are actually standing before God saying, here I am, Lord, this is what I want you to do. Which one's right? Here I am, this is what, what do you want me to do? Or here I am, this is what I want you to do. One's consumer Christianity. One is the world revolves around me and it's all about me. But here's the question. Do you exist to serve God's purposes or does God exist to serve your purposes? We need to answer that question. And if we are really here to serve God, we need to offer ourselves to him saying, here I am. What do you want me to do? Um, and as we do that, Christians are then meant to serve humbly in accord with God's will. Just remember, first bit sacrificially, next bit humbly. Look with me at verse 3. Look at verse 3. It says, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Notice, first thing, offer yourselves to God as a living sacrifice. As soon as you do that, the first thing God says, okay, little pig, don't get carried away. Don't think too highly of yourself. Don't think you're better than you really are but have a sober understanding of yourself. Notice that? Immediately as we're called to start serving God, God starts saying, watch out for pride, watch out for arrogance, watch out for conceit. You know what the biggest destroy to Christian ministry is all the time? Pride, arrogance, conceit. I want you to serve, but don't become proud. Here's the crazy thing. When we realize that God, the creator of the universe, has a job for us to do, and he's actually gifted us to do that job, we start going, I'm pretty special. I'm pretty cool. And God's got something for me to do. I, well, I must be special. And then we start comparing ourselves to other Christians. Or we start comparing how much work we're doing to other Christians, and it all of a sudden goes south. It wrecks it. The Bible says pride comes before a fall. And the minute we start getting puffed up with pride, thinking, oh, look at me, I'm singing up the front of church. Oh, look at me, I'm now leading the service. Or I've got this special ministry I'm doing. Aren't I fantastic? And the whole thing starts falling apart. I want to share with you something, and I'm a little bit embarrassed to share it. I'm a sinner like the rest of you, and here's a little bit of my battle with pride. 
Many years ago, God called me to come into full-time ministry and I felt that call strongly, it wouldn't go away. My first response was, I don't want to go into full-time ministry. I kind of counted the cost. I thought, what's it going to cost me to go into full-time ministry? I'm going to have to give up this and this and this. I don't want to do it. Now, thankfully, God has been far better to me than I deserve, and he has blessed me in all sorts of ways being in full-time ministry. But at first, I didn't want to do it, okay? Then, bit by bit, as God brought me around, and I started thinking, oh, maybe I will go into full-time ministry. You know the first thing that came into my mind? Maybe I'll be the next George Whitfield or the next Billy Graham. I haven't even gone to Bible college yet and I'm getting puffed up with pride and arrogance and thinking, oh, God's going to do amazing things with me. And I'm like, what the? So pride comes great. And straight away, as that pride came running in, a question came to me. And I can only think it came from the Holy Spirit because I don't think it came from me. As I'm getting puffed up with pride, this question comes and it will not go away. The question that came to me was this. Matthew, will you go into full-time ministry for me even if it means only one other person is saved by your ministry? Will you go into full-time ministry for me for the rest of your life if it means only one other person is saved as a result of your ministry? What does the answer have to be? Yes. If that's what you want me to do, Lord, yes. You see what God was doing? Straight away he was humbling me, going, I want you to serve, but get those arrogant big thoughts out of your head. You were not called to be glorious. You were not called to change the world. You were actually called to wash feet. That's enough. That's where true greatness is, in washing feet. And maybe God has been kind to me and not ever giving me a huge ministry that would go to my head. He's taught me again and again about washing feet. Washing feet. Watch out for pride, says God, as you begin to serve. Friends, I want to remind you that Jesus washed feet and it wasn't grandiose and it wasn't glorious and then he went to the cross and he died on the cross for our sins. And that wasn't particularly glorious or fantastic or look at me, aren't I wonderful? It was costly. It hurt. It wasn't easy and it wasn't something to be proud of. We don't serve for the recognition of others, the applause of others. We don't actually serve so that we can pat ourselves on the back and go, look at the amazing things I did for God's kingdom. We serve because Jesus served and he has called us to wash feet like himself. So I have a couple of things I just want to say on this. We serve God for God's pleasure. We serve God to put a smile on God's face. Um, I want you to remember this. Just Your service is for an audience of one. Can you remember that? You live your life as a Christian for the audience of one, for God. Other people may never give recognition to the good things you are doing for God. Other people may never notice or applaud you or say, well done, but here's the thing. If you are truly serving for God's pleasure and God's service, God will see that. And he will reward you for that one day, irrespective of what other people have noticed. Of course, if you're actually doing it for the applause of yourself or for recognition, it kind of nullifies your service of God. You're not doing it for him, you're, you're doing it for yourself. But what I want to say to you is God is actually calling you to serve. And as you serve, if you're a young Christian, I'd say don't aspire for the big jobs too quickly. Just come up with something small you can do. It may be welcome at the beginning of church. It may be helping with Sunday school or morning tea. What is something small you can do? And then I say to you, do it to the best of your ability. Wash feet to the best of your ability as doing it for the Lord, not for men. The Bible actually warns us, doesn't it, that we shouldn't give too big a positions to young Christians because they become puffed up and fall into the trap of the devil. It's crazy, isn't it? You give people too much responsibility in the church too much, you, you become proud and arrogant. And even mature Christians struggle when you get up the front or you get a significant role not to become proud and arrogant. The second thing I want to say to you is this. You serve God in order to become like Jesus. You serve God in order to become like Jesus. So 
if you are striving to become like Jesus, stop comparing what you're doing to what everyone else is doing. Yes, other Christians in the church may be being lazy. Other Christians in the church may actually be consumer thinkers. Other Christians in the church may appear to have all the easy jobs while you have all the hard jobs. Stop comparing yourself to anyone else. Who are you meant to compare yourself to? Jesus. And here's the thing. When you're washing feet as well as Jesus and you're making sacrifices bigger than Jesus, then maybe you've got a right to complain and have a witch. But until that point, stop comparing yourself to others and just get on with whatever the job is that God has called you to do. And here's my final point on this issue. The final bit is we serve God according to the measure of our faith. You notice that talk to the end of verse 3 about according to the measure of your faith? What is the measure of your faith right now? Are you a young, immature Christian, or are you becoming an older, more mature Christian who's been around the block a few times? At this point, to say, yes, I'm a more mature Christian, I'm growing up, almost sounds proud and arrogant, the very things we've been warned not to do. And yet, here's another reality. In God's church, we need mature Christians to be doing and undertaking certain tasks. We need mature Christians to be leading Bible study groups. We need mature Christians to be serving on church council. We need mature Christians to lead services and prayers. And here's my question. What is the measure of your faith? Have you become over time a mature Christian and it's now time for you to step up and accept greater responsibility? You see, there can actually be a false humility. There's a false humility that sometimes serves as an excuse. Oh, I, I could never do anything like that because... Or it goes, oh, I could never do something because of some sin in the past. The reality is God is growing our faith as Christians so that he can actually grow us as servant leaders. You're not just meant to stay a servant, you're meant to become a servant leader like the Lord Jesus Christ. Having influence, leading others by example in what it looks like to really lead. Um, God, it's a great website if you're ever looking for Christian resources. And on this website, uh, there were five things, five marks that they gave of a true servant leader. Um, a servant leader seeks the glory of God more than public approval or financial security. A servant leader seeks the highest joy of those they serve, even sacrificially putting others before self. A servant leader will forego their rights for the sake of the gospel. Just hear this one out. A servant leader, even when he is in the right, is willing to accept being in the wrong in order for the gospel to go forth and for immature Christians to continue growing rather than making a point that I'm right. A servant leader is not preoccupied with personal visibility or recognition and a servant leader graciously accepts the time for their decrease. You remember John the Baptist said, it's time for Jesus to become greater and it's time for me to become lesser. It happens to everyone in ministry and there's a time for us to step back and there's a time for us to step up. These are the marks of a servant leader and so I ask you, where are you at the moment? Are you willing to serve? In view of God's mercy, are you willing to step up? Has God enlarged your faith sufficiently, enlarged your humility sufficiently that you can begin to lead within the church? My final point for today is this. Christians are meant not just to serve sacrificially and humbly, we're meant to serve with the gifts and the experiences God has given us in accordance with God's will. Look with me from verse uh, 4, reading from verse 4. Look at what it says. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion or according to the measure of his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, 
let him do it cheerfully. The main point in these last verses is that we all have something to offer in God's family. All of us have gifts and experiences which enable us to contribute to the glory of God in the church. Uh, for some of us, it may be helping on Sunday school, helping at the door, helping with morning tea. For others of us, it might be stepping up and starting to lead a Bible study group, helping on parish councils, serving in the music ministry. We all have different gifts and abilities. Uh, what, what has God given you? What is the unique things about your culture that means only you can minister to people of your culture? What are the experiences of life, both good and bad, that means you can have compassion and empathy with people who others may not understand? What are the gifts and abilities you have been given to serve with, and are you using them for God's glory? Now, this passage likens all of us in the church to different parts of God's body. Um, we have this human body, it's made up of all the different parts, and every part in the human body is important. I love having a nose that can actually smell the beautiful pizza as the box comes open. That's good. We need ears as well. My ears aren't so good. But there's some people who can kind of pick out the rhythm and the beat of the music and lead us in worship. We need the ears. Other people can speak. Their, their tongues are just great at encouraging people building people up. Others are the hands who pack the food on Friday nights and actually help people. The reality is all of us are like different parts of the body. It's when we work together that we achieve the most for God's kingdom. Now you might think, okay, some parts of the body are more important than others. I need the heart, but I can do without the appendix. Or, or I need the head, but I can do without my little finger. Uh, that's not God's point. God's point is, I made the human body with all the different parts, and the human body does best when they all work together. And the same is true of the church. God has made the church. He's given each one of us different gifts, experiences, opportunities, and we actually work best. We serve God best when we work together for his glory. And so I'm asking again, what can you do for God's kingdom? What are your passions for God? What are the things that interest you? What can you do that is uniquely from you that can be used for God's glory? On the way in today, I've actually handed out a spiritual gift survey. Can you just hold up one, Robert, up the back? Did people receive the spiritual gift survey on the way in? Robert's holding one up the back. The purpose of this gift is it's from Rick Warren. It's from the same guy who wrote Purpose Driven Life. Uh, for his church in Saddleback in, in the United States. There's a whole lot of pages. You go through, you tick all the appropriate boxes. You work out your passions, your shape, your gifts. And then on the end, you kind of consolidate the results. And I would love you all to take the time, the 20 minutes I think it'll take, to fill in that sheet. If you're a regular member of our church, fill it in during the week and give it back to myself or to Jeff or to Sylvia so that we can work out where best to use you in the church? Where best you can serve? Now, I know some of you can go, nah, nah, I'm too busy. I've got too many other things to do. My life is full already. I want you to remember this. What did I begin by saying? In order to serve God, what does it require? Sacrifice. And all I'm asking you to do to fill in this form, all I'm asking for is to sacrifice one episode of Big Bang Theory. It's not a huge sacrifice, is it? One episode of a current affair. Friends, can you please fill this form in, return it to us so that together we can work the best we possibly can for the glory of God. And there may be things that you're passionate about, things you're good at that I don't know about, that the church doesn't know about. I want to share with you the reason for doing this is there is actually a blessing in serving God with our gifts. I just want to show you what Jesus said after he washed the disciples' feet, the very last verse, do you notice what it says? Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Notice it doesn't say you'll be blessed in knowing them. Where will you be blessed? In doing them. Here's the reality, guys. There are some blessings of God that you will never know and you will never receive until you start serving as God wants you to serve. 
It's only as you serve God that you truly understand what it is to show someone grace. It's only as you serve that he will actually grow you in faithfulness, teach you how to wash feet, show you how to love the unlovely. It's only as you serve that God can actually grow you so you become like Jesus. But even better, as we serve God as he intended us, I think there is an internal blessing that comes to us as well. It's not just becoming like Jesus. When we truly serve with an honest heart, God, giving him the glory that he deserves, sacrificially, humbly, with our gifts, there's this wonderful, noble, beautiful, content blessing that comes from knowing we've done something that is eternal, something that is bigger than ourselves, something that has actually put a smile on God's face, even though it's hard. There's something beautiful. There's a blessing that comes when we know that we are in step with God's spirit and we are doing what God wants us to do. And so, friends, I just challenge you. God is calling us in response to his mercy to serve sacrificially, to serve humbly, and to serve with the gifts and life experiences that he has given us. So as I finish today, I've got a prayer. It's again from Purpose Driven Life. Now I'm going to ask you as a church, if you've been challenged by today's sermon, if you think it's probably right, will you please pray with me? Let's pray now. It's on the screen. Together, wonderful Father, help me to remember today that I was put on earth to serve you by serving others. Thank you for the privilege of being a part of what you are doing through your church in the world. Amen.